You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul, and I have a very special guest with me today. You may know him for his participation in the campfire in California, or you may know him from his agricultural course from Scholar Farms. Either way, his name is Greg Kretzinger. Kretzinger. I didn't want to mess that up. Ah, Greg. That's all good. Welcome I've to the show. I've messed up my entire life. So <laughs> oh, really? Like, yeah, used to it. Common theme. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I'm really excited to have you on the show, especially as we've got the Phantom 4 multispectral here today, because you really are one of the foremost experts when it comes to agricultural mapping in, in my eyes. So for those of our viewers who may not know you, give us a little brief history. How'd you get involved with the campfire? What did you do on that project? And how did Scholar Farms become what it is today? Yeah, it's been a bit of a wayward path um, in the drone industry. So I was a professor. So my PhD is in plant science, actually. Wow. And so I started using drones for mapping uh, experiments. So big plots of trees and other things I wanted to speed up the process. This was around 2014. We were still zip tying cameras to the bottom of drones. And I got so excited about the automation of capturing plant data that I dropped out of being a professor, uh, which seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> uh, and it's been a bit of a wild ride over the past five years or so working for some of the major hardware and software companies in the industry, many companies that people have heard of. And I've had great experiences with that, but I've also been caught in the tumultuous times of the drone industry. I mean, I've been laid off before, uh, just like a lot of people in the industry and moved on to other companies. And uh, I started working with Pix4D and I got excited about the data side of drones. And I ultimately, I started Scholar Farms as a consultancy just around vegetation data. Hey, this is harder to map than just normal stockpiles and real estate and things. How do we cut through some of the smoke and mirrors in the industry and really give people a good quality education? The public safety side is just something uh, I fell into just knowing public safety people in that were starting to use drones in the Bay Area where I live in California. And when there were some incidents in California, starting with the ghost ship fire and then the major wildfires in California, I came in just to provide a little bit of advice on mapping. And then that ultimately led to me being a data analyst for the teams that, so the public safety teams are flying, but someone needs to stitch all the data and then visualize that and get that to the agencies. And so so that became my role. Uh, I don't. Hey, if you're uh, the expert, they're coming to you, right? At this point, they're saying, hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah, Let's take his direction. I, you know, and some of it has just been inventing methods and protocols as we go along. So the deployment for uh, drones in emergencies is fairly well established for just getting a, wa a live feed, and people are starting to scale that across teams of public safety. But how do you map and do disaster assessment and, and get that out incredibly quickly? That hasn't been formulated as much, and, and we're starting to get good at capturing the data and turning it around really fast. Do you think Pix4D React, sorry, switch tracking really fast, do you think Pix4D React may help solve the whole problem of, of disaster mapping fast? I think it will for, so React is a new product that was just launched with Pix4D. Have you talked about it on the show? Yeah, yet? we actually did the, I think one of the first podcasts on Pix4D React, so. So React, ultra fast 2D maps in full resolution that are coming out and with lower overlap. So folks are getting down to 40, 35% overlap or side lap, which means you can cover much bigger areas and process us offline. So the internet is a problem in these disasters. So as a new product, I think for offline processing, which is a lot of disaster zones, I think it'll be a really powerful tool for capturing and processing the data. And then the challenge will be how do we then visualize it and disseminate that information quickly as well. So you still have gigabytes of maps. How do you then get those to the right place? That'll still be the challenge is, yeah. is all that information and getting it to the people that need it. For sure, for sure. Well, back back on track. So the campfire, uh, you know, you being a part of that, leading that, that entourage, you know, being a part of, you know, the logistics, the navigation, the data science, that was a significantly large data set, right? I mean, like for people out there who may not know about this, uh, what kind of size area are we talking about? Yeah, so the, the campfire came in and hit the towns of Megalia and Paradise uh, uh, pretty much 
uh, decimating a lot of the town almost overnight. So the, a lot of the damage happened within the first 24 hours of the fire spreading incredibly uh, quickly and just coming through the town and sparking more embers and winds blowing and starting st spot fires. And so the priority was really just getting people out for the first, you know, just getting people to safety. And there were dozens of fatalities that happened. And so after the incident, then it was um, it was really a recovery effort. And there were a lot of people missing and unaccounted for that were, you know, that had made it out. They were just unaccounted for on a list from relatives and other folks. So a lot of the endeavor was coming in under some of the law enforcement teams that really led the safety side of things. So they're the ones that coordinate all the effort of bringing in teams and pilots and doing things safely. And then my role is really just to lead the data side to make sure they're capturing the data and mapping quickly. So initially they wanted a smaller section of the town that was just gonna be about 2000 acres, which was a big job, but not impossible. And then ultimately the request was for the full area, which was um, around 12 to 15,000 acres, depending on how you drew the maps and cut out areas that weren't populated or parks or things like that. Uh, so it was a significant effort especially considering we're using multi-rotors. So we're typically using phantoms because that's what these teams have and know and use. And we don't want to introduce uh, platforms like a fixed wing, like an EB or something like that when the teams aren't experienced with them. And visual line of sight rules were what we needed to have. So you had to maintain visual line of sight in rolling hills in fairly smoky conditions. And you just couldn't use an EB for that. It would just disappear fairly quickly and, and you would lose line of sight. Interesting. So the goal was just to get Get it all mapped and coordinate that effort and and i was just one member of lots of agencies that were involved on the flying side and the safety side so i don't want to overplay my role no i think know, no i it. think it's it's you know wise decision um but i also it's interesting how you kind of fell into it you know essentially showcasing different things that were possible and now all of a sudden you know you're a part of the whole team so i you know obviously i think it showcases you know good intentions because a lot of people are always worried about you know hurricane harvey mm -hmm. everyone just you know jumping into hurricane harvey like hey I got a drone, yeah. I know how to use it. And it's like, well, do you know how to comprehensively cover an area? Yeah. How are you gonna ensure that? You know, how, how are you gonna- And there's a lot of quality control, like are the maps, you know, you need to do quick stitches to make sure it's gonna stitch and the maps are gonna uh, be able to be merged together that you have enough seams there. So for me, it's the drone side, actually we're dialing in and have pretty good protocols of like, hey, here's how you deploy teams very quickly. And the uh, law enforcement and fire teams are very good at organizing themselves I let them organize themselves. Uh, uh, but then it's the data side, like how do we take this huge amount of, I mean, we were ultimately it was about a half a terabyte of information, you wow. know, four, around 475 gigs of map data and then videos and other things and panoramas that we try and merge all together. And it really took coming together with the drone industry. So uh, drone deploy was instrumental in stitching online survey, which is a georeference video product. I uh, was instrumental on in getting the videos up and maps. Uh, Hangar helps with Hangar 360s and some of troubleshooting. So I'm on the phone with all these companies all the time. And so having a network within the industry and uh, playing nice with everyone and getting along and having everyone come together and be willing to help was really appreciated and, and instrumental in getting it done. It took everybody to come in and get it done and turned around so quickly. Well, that's, it's, it's incredible, uh, honestly, the effect that you've had on people. And, you know, as we were talking about, you know, phantoms versus EBs, we've got the phantom for multispectral here. And there are a lot of questions about multispectral. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wanted to have you on the show is because, well, you, you're literally a scientist when it comes to vegetation. So um, I think it's really important for everyone out there to really hear the ideology of what's really possible w with a multispectral drone. Is this really a more efficient platform than if we're using something like an EB or a Wingtra? Um, and what can we really use this for? I mean, like a lot of people are out there and they're like, oh, I'm just gonna do NDVI mapping for the rest of my days. But is there really a market in agriculture right now? And what can we really use this for? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. So my background is really as a plant ecologist. I'm kind of a boots on the ground kind of guy. Like I hike around and stretch meter tapes and count things on plants. And I'm not a remote sensing scientist who's spent a long time thinking about satellite imagery and multispectral imagery. I know a lot of remote sensing people when I have those super technical questions about how light is calibrated or how sensors are working. 
but what I've been doing over the past uh, two years building Scholar Farms is really um, testing different cameras, working with the different companies that are out there building multi-spectral cameras and color cameras as well. And there's been a lot, a significant pain point of integrating aftermarket or third-party cameras with the drones, triggering, getting good quality data, mapping. We're kind of, if you think back to 2014, 2015, when you like forgot to turn the GoPro on before you launched oh, the man. drone, or uh, you turned it on, but you forgot the SD card. Or um, it didn't have the right settings. Right. Yeah. So like, that's kind of where we've been even today with some of the cameras and, and the communication protocols with DJI and the, and the payload SDK. So what DJI, I believe, has done is taken all the good pieces that they've seen out in the industry and kind of put it together in a single package of just a cohesive solution. And Isn't that DJI's MO on most things? Yeah, I mean, they've made it easy and they've made it relatively cheap. So it starts at around $6,200 for the non-RTK version. And to put that in perspective, like even the lower cost multi-spectral cameras are around 3,500 just for the camera. Um, and typically they're around $5,000. And so having it be relatively cost effective for what the market has seen, it puts them in a very competitive position. Do you think that that opens up the market as a whole for more people to service the agricultural market? It's definitely made the data capture side. I haven't flown it yet, so I'm- I, A lot I'm, of caveats here. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, but if it's anything like the standard Phantom workflow, it will make things just much more cohesive in terms of capturing the data. This raises that data problem again of like, then what do you do with it? How good are these multispectral data? Is it, you know, this multispectral data is capturing wavelengths of light bouncing off of plants and back into the sensor. And from those wavelengths of light, we're trying to tell something about the health of the plant or the greenness or photosynthetic capability or yield or all these different things that people are looking for. That's not a trivial thing. You have to calculate in um, how light bounces off the plants back into the camera. You have to calculate. Which is based off the current amount of light that's coming from the sun, correct? That's right. So the sun's shining down, light's bouncing off of the leaves. Some of that's getting absorbed by the leaves and being used by the plants because plants eat light, basically. Uh, well, the way that I like try to explain it to people is that every organic compound has a specific quantitative value of absorbency and reflectivity of light. Mm -hmm. And that multispectral camera are essentially able to pick up multiple bands of wavelengths versus hyperspectral cameras, which essentially, you know, we always talk about in class, it's the needle in the haystack. If I want to find turquoise on the beach, 100%. Uh, hyperspectral. Yeah, so I think the multispectral cameras typically are designed for the wavelengths of light that we know in general most plants are using for photosynthesis. And the ultimate end product is what's called a reflectance map, or how much light is bouncing back to your camera. Well, that map will change if it's a bright day or a cloudy day, then reflectance is going to be huge if it's really sunny, and it'll be less if it's overcast. So most of the cameras that are out there have light sensors. They're called different things, just depending on the company, but it's a, it captures how much light is coming down and it corrects your map so you can compare. Like this sensor right here on the top? That's right. So on the RTK, what's normally the RTK GPS and it is here, uh, it should capture, and I haven't looked at the should. technical specs. <laughs> it should. So this is a six band camera. So it's RGB for color imagery red, green, blue individually, red edge and near infrared, which are out of the visible spectrum, but plants tend to reflect a lot of that light bounces off the leaves. Typically on a light sensor, you're collecting the amount of the, the, how much light is coming down from the sun in those wavelengths. So it should tag the photos with the amount of inbound light so you can correct for the total. So, okay, there's so many questions I want to ask you right now, and I feel like we still haven't even got to what is the drone like good for, what are the actual use cases for, sure. which we've got to go into next, but I just have to say I want to make sure that we don't miss a couple key factors here because, you know, you've talked about the absorbency and reflectancy of light, and we have a sensor that's measuring what is the actual light right now. Mm -hmm. And my question, one of my questions is, you know, if I'm in forward flight, and I'm measuring light that way, and let's say I'm at direct sunlight, but my camera's pointing straight down, are those values going to, going to differentiate? And how is that going to affect our overall data product? And then my second question is, you know, you mentioned something that we talked about at the conference today, which was, do you really need the RTK version or not? Because 
are you know are farmers really utilizing the RTK based data? And someone had mentioned, well, actually yes, because if I'm indexing every single plant on my farm, I actually do need to have that level of accuracy so that everything fits right into place. Sure. Lots of questions. Yeah. So Use we'll start. Cases. We'll yeah. start with the gimbal. So putting <laughs> typically what you want for the geometry. There's a lot of sun angle and light bouncing around math that goes into it and the science behind this. Typically. I, and there is controversy here on gimbalizing the camera. Then Ty that's what I wanted yeah, to touch so on So typically too. you want the light sensor running in parallel with the camera in terms of pointing direction. And you want that to be a fixed point. So you can imagine an imaginary pole running through the light sensor in the camera. And so you don't want the camera to move independently. I, I, I would imagine that this flies with the camera pointed straight down or, or nadir, and then the light sensor would be in line with it. Now, if it's tilting and moving independently, that will change the pointing direction of the camera relative to the pointing direction of the light sensor and may change the math. But all of that ends up being information tagged on the photos. And so it's going to be dependent a lot on how DJI and Terra or anyone else is doing the post-processing and the calibration of the imagery using the light data. Is DJI going to open up the imagery for the light calibration? Is that a black box that they're doing? Like, I don't know. That's, that's what these post-processing software, whether it's Drone Deploy has announced at uh, the DJI conference that they're going to be processing this imagery. I'm sure everyone else, whether it's Pix4D or Agisoft, will be trying to process it because you have a fully off-the-shelf solution, but the data the, the, the really will be the determinant of how successful the product is. So the data, that's a big deal. Yeah. But what about the interpretation of the data? Because one of the big deals with the P4M or just multispectral data as a whole is that even if we have actionable data, how does the farmer take that data and interpret it? 100%. So dr farm drones or agricultural drones have been around for a while, and we're kind of in round three now of agricultural drones. And what we can do is produce map layers for every single band, and we can do math between the bands and produce new layers of uh, different vegetation indices. NDVI is one of 100 different indices we can produce. But what people really want is answers. How much nitrogen should I apply? Is there, can I detect pests early? Uh, can I forecast yield? And the answer to that is it depends on the relationship between the imagery and the end thing you're trying to look at. And that changes with every crop in every place throughout the growing season. And every wine. Depends on the variety. It right. depends on your field applications. And to get to a dollar return investment on your data takes six different steps. I have to fly it. I have to map it. I have to ground truth the imagery and look at the relationships. Then I need to make a decision on it. And then I have to wait until the end of the growing season to look at the return on that decision. And that's a really hard thing compared to measuring stockpiles where you fly it, you get a volume and that volume's worth the amount of gravel that's flying, you know, or gold or whatever you're trying to get out of it. True. So that's why drones in agriculture have, um, it's been really good for spot checking and just determining problem spots in your field. But taking action on it is really, takes an agronomist or someone to make specific recommendations. We don't want to make, as an industry, recommendations on how much nitrogen you should put on if we don't know those relationships and don't trust them, because then that's a dollar value. If you mess up, you're liable for the recommendation because that's a dollar out of nitrogen or amount of loss in a cross that you're going to be liable for. So what I'm hearing is that you've got to be working with some sort of crop that has high dollar value, because if like you gave the example earlier of I could just be a Cabernet Savion, <laughs> um, you know, multispectral mapper. And while the opportunity to save them a lot of money is high, it seems like the liability is also quite high as well. And so it depends. Um, so on the field scouting side, which is the simplest thing, you can do that today with a Mavic or a Phantom 4 just with an RGB camera. Good quality RGB, first and foremost, is the best way to visualize fields. You can also do false color indices, drone deployed, it does pretty good in terms of picking up variability for an individual time. Now through time, those lighting conditions will change your green pixels to red pixels or whatever false color they're applying. Now stepping it up to more precise precision management, that's where the science comes in of, hey, you need to know a little bit about the relationships here. And then, you know, High value crops are one application where drones are good. They're usually smaller scale. You can map berries and vineyards and things on a couple of batteries compared to 
all of the corn in Iowa, where a Cessna or satellite data is going to be a much better return on investment. Or for me, I work with a lot of clients that are doing breeding trials or, or phenotyping, measuring the traits of plants. And then I need the RTK. I need every plant to be aligned from one net map to the next map. And I need to be able to trust those trait values for developing a seed product or, or some other application that I'm using. So it ranges from the quick and dirty to the high scientific, high dollar value value. And if you're a service provider, you want to find that sweet spot in between where you're providing good value data. Thankfully, we have a, a new product that probably will do a pretty good job. And then I need to deliver that in a way that at least I know I'm confident I'm producing good quality data and find partners that will help me interpret that, whether it's local agronomists or whatnot, dial it in for your specific area. It goes back to that interpretation and action on the data. Yeah. And I know that you, you can be trained to collect good quality imagery and trust it. You just might not know, hey, what does this variability mean? Is that a nutrient issue? Is it a soil issue? Is it a pest issue? Et cetera. So one thing that you just mentioned is, you know, small high value areas, right? We've got a multi-rotor here now. Typically multi-spectral cameras are fixed wing mount. Typically they're fixed angle mount. Is this going to be a more efficient solution for typical uh, agricultural based workflow? So part of the issue with ag, at doing it at scale, has really been more about visual line of sight and maintaining visual line of sight. I can fly a fixed wing for six hours technically, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not able to do that for legal reasons. With multi-rotor, it's been more about battery life. Mm -hmm. Hey, this flies for 20 minutes or so, um, and I, I can't really map uh, a thousand acre property doing it 20 minutes at a time very easily and pay for my time and make that a good return. Until recently with new products like Pix40 Fields or React, um, where you're actually getting much lower overlap and still good quality imagery. And so that lower overlap actually allows you to map bigger areas and stitch it while you're still in the field. So hold on, are you saying that there is an advantage for using Pix40 Fields over other services because of the lower amount of overlap? So I. Pix4D Fields, has they, recently they've updated it to allow for radiometric corrections, that light data and calibrating your imagery, as well as the lower overlap and the rapid processing offline. I don't need to wait eight hours. I can get it in 15 minutes or so uh, on not a $3,000 computer. And so that makes a huge difference for um, just applying the data, getting it fast while you're still in the field and be able to... To, to walk out into the field. Now, some of the real-time NDVI metrics or even RGB with live map with drone deploy, for example, those are those may be good products. I just haven't tripped, you know, I haven't tested out the new platform yet, so it remains to be seen. Is this accurately depicting the information I see in this? So field? then let, let's end with this. What are your three biggest questions for this platform that you haven't flown yet? And we're testing tomorrow, luckily, yeah. but what are your three biggest questions? So number one is, how does it look in Terra? So I haven't been able to test Terra for any of their- They won't let me test any it either. Any of their mapping products why, so. as of yet. Um, are they giving me uh, reflectance <laughs> maps for the individual bands? How well can I do different indices? Is it radiometric? How well are you collect correcting the light uh, data? And then. My second question is how soon will it be adopted in other software I'm already using, like fields where I can do a rapid stitch offline. I use fields now more than I do Mapper because it's so fast and the data are so good and I can fly 50% uh, more area with lower overlap and have that while I'm out there. And so how quickly will these other companies be able to adopt the imagery? Um, it, so, so no, no, you yeah. bring up a good question. I'm wondering if the data is platform agnostic. Like I'm wondering if there's something in the data set that's saying I'm going to work better with Terra than Fields because I, I would say that Pix4D Fields for sure has the capture, get it, pix 40 anyway, uh, has the capture on the market. Um, and I think, again, you know, when, you know, when OnGood came to the fly-in last year and showed everyone pix 40 fields, it was very evident of the value add. Mm -hmm. And it, but again, I think where people need to be educated is how do you interpret this data yeah. and help a farmer make actionable decisions? So I think we've now democratized the data collection side and made it much easier. Um, but giving someone 15 different layers and not 
really answers and just is, is not going to help. And so I could see people focusing more on the data and the analytics side of really flushing out what those answers are. First in maybe row crops, maybe it's just stand counts, which is pretty easy to do. It seems like everyone's working towards that counting individual corn plants when they're young and the leaves aren't touching to zonation. Here's the high, medium and low areas of my field, which is better, easier to categorize than every single pixel. And what do I do here to making nutrient and nitrogen uh, recommendations and knowing, hey, at least with some crops, we can make these recommendations and we can give you answers. Um, I really think that and machine learning and auto calculation plant size and those kind of things is the direction that we're headed. How do we get to the answer faster? So I just don't have a pretty colored map that it actually gives me results. So it seems like there's a, a lot of reason for you to come back on the show later <laughs> and discuss the findings yeah, with we'll this see drone. What it looks like I'm super excited uh, to at least get it out in the field and run it through its paces. It should solve a lot of pain points when it comes to rigging cameras and capturing the data. And now it'll be how good are the results and how well can I work with them in these different platforms where I'm using my imagery. Wow. Well, uh, Greg, thank you so much for coming yeah, on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah. If people want to learn more about Scholar Farms, where should they go? So scholarfarms.com. I have an online masterclass uh, that I teach. And then I also run workshops specifically on vegetation mapping with an occasional disaster zone. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Greg, thank you again for coming on the show, my friend. All appreciate right. It. Thank you. <laughs> well, that is going to do it for our show today. If you want to learn more about Greg, which you should, because he is one of the foremost experts when it comes to agricultural based mapping. Make sure to check that out at scholarfarms.com. And if you have a question, don't forget, go to askdroneu.com so we can get those questions answered. And I have to say personally, Greg, I'm really excited for the follow-up of this particular show because it seems like there's more questions than there are answers. There are. yeah. And I mean, it seems like it also, those questions and answers have so many variables it's almost like well it depends on this it depends yeah. on this it depends on that so then that's been the challenge with farm drones is it depends it also has been the challenge with new dji equipment where they say it'll do x and it actually does y yeah and, it may take some time to dial in but i'm hopeful yeah i am hopeful as well i feel like dji has definitely done a good job at mastering equipment but on that bombshell that's going to do it for us today thanks again for watching don't forget to leave us a review and we will see you next time thanks again for watching another episode of ask drone you